Top of the morning to ya. If it isn't Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com. Yes, I am Amelia Dalton. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. And today's episode of Fish Fry has absolutely nothing to do with Ireland. Or St. Patrick. But it has everything to do with cell-like robots programmed with DNA, general-purpose computing on graphic processing units, and featherweight systems for unmanned aerial vehicles. Kind of sounds like that new King Kong movie, maybe. (laughs) All right. Robots. Yawn. Right? But what about tiny robots? Or really, really tiny robots? Oh, no. Not even nanoscale. That's totally last week's news. No, we're talking about amoeba size robotic systems that move like a cell. Yeah. So a team of researchers in Japan have constructed an amoeba-like molecular robot that continuously changes shape in response to specific signal molecules and can propel itself with cell-like motion through a fluid environment. And even better, the motion of this amoeba-sized robot can be turned on and off with DNA signals that respond to light. Super cool. Okay, so this tiny robotic system is actually made up of 27 biological and chemical components. And the robot itself is made of three parts, a body, an actuator, and an actuator controlling device or clutch. So that body is kind of a sack that is made from a lipid membrane, which serves as a malleable robot body. And that actuator consists of proteins, kinesin, and microtubules. Okay, so it's that actuator controlling device or clutch that's key to the movement of this molecular robot. It was constructed using designated DNA molecules. It transmits the force generated by the motor to the membrane in response to a signal molecule composed of another chemically modified DNA. So, when the clutch is engaged, the molecular robot changes its shape, like you'd see in a human cell. But when the robot was illuminated with a light source, which then triggered the release of that signal molecule, the movement stopped. Okay, so, how is this advancement any different from those cancer-killing robots that started making news last week, or any other nanoscale robots on the horizon? Well, since these robots are composed entirely of biological and chemical components and moves like a cell and is controlled by DNA, this team claims that these robots, above all else, represent a truly unique kind of controllable motility. So, other than its ability to wiggle around and the amoeba-like robot can't do much, right? (laughs) Well, au contraire, the brilliance is right there. This team from Japan contend that when this molecular robot is outfitted with a wide range of tools, just imagine it, tiny computers, sensors, even drugs, this system could then be used to explore our biomolecular environment, which could seek out toxins or even check the surface of other cells, or even the contents of a Petri dish. (laughs) Okay, so if you want even more information about this research into the world of molecular robots, I've included a link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com that will take you to a super cool article entitled Micrometer-Sized Molecular Robot Changes Its Shape in Response to Signal Molecules. Super cool. And now for something completely, utterly, and absolutely different, please welcome Doug Patterson from AI Tech to Fish Fry. Doug and I are talking about UAVs, GPGPUs, and more. Check it out. Hi, Doug. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So first off, for my audience who may not know, what is AI Tech all about? AI Tech is a company that produces rugged, computing systems, rugged embedded computing systems for defense aerospace and now diversifying into some other markets like transportation and autonomous vehicles. 
Cool. Okay, so let's talk about graphic processing in GPUs. Give sure. my audience a little bit of background first about GP GPUs. Where have they come from? And what are the issues or challenges that GP GPUs were created to solve? Wow, a multi-parter. Yes. <laughs> Graphics processors came about from really the, the hardware systems that used to do it ages ago, like 20 years ago. It was all done in hardware. How to scan the raster across the screen and either turn a pixel on or off. Sure. Right? So the hardware would do that. You'd load up a memory bank and it went off and did it. Then we, you have the issues associated with as the displays are getting higher resolution and as the sensors that are tied into these displays are, are bringing more and more sensor data to the system, yeah. displaying that information accurately to the operator is important. So what the GPU, the graphics processor unit, was doing maybe five years ago or so was taking a lot of that aspect of taking the automation of taking the pixels and bringing it out to the screen in greater clarity. Okay. Right. So a long time ago, you had eight bits per pixel, and that was good enough for shade. Yeah. You know, it's with gray, it's either all the way on, all the way off, or some gray in between. Yet now, in today's systems, you've got 24 bits per pixel. Right. So each one now, you have a number of pixels that's millions and millions now of pixels. You've got 8 meg, 25 meg. You can just go on and on and on with the size of the sensors that are out there, as well as the displays, as well as the... so. You're looking at displays that need much more information and they need it much more quickly. Sure. There's processing that goes along with displaying that data, the shading, let's say, making automated shaders. So not only are you providing data to the GPU, you're also telling it to provide a, an area of shade across so you can provide gradient shading right. to an area. So you define the area and tell it to gradient shade and it will do it for you mm -hmm. as opposed to having to do it in software yourself. Yeah. Also in my presentation I talked about anti-aliasing. That was a long time ago trying to draw a line on a screen and getting a stair step yeah. and then shading those pixels next to it in a nearest neighbor algorithm in order to make the line. It blurs the line, but it straightens it out. Yeah. So, and a long time ago, that was perfectly fine. Today, yeah. no, you're not going to get away with that. So really, a, a lot of the things that's going on in today's commercial industries is the gamers. The gamers sure. are pushing that envelope hard, but they don't care if they're dissipating three, four, or 500 watts. Right. Right? But defense and aerospace applications, they care about that kind of power. So this is why the product that we have, we brought it to market, which is the GPGPU based on the Jetson, that product is about 17 watts max. You, you top it out, it runs about 17 watts, 66 gigaflops per watt, okay. which today is unheard of. I yeah. mean, you, you couldn't do that. You couldn't even pray of doing something <laughs> like that five years ago. It's right. just today, it's, they would have taken a whole mainframe to get it done or racks of servers. Sure. Today, it's a chip, the, maybe a one-inch square chip. So where do you think we're going in this space? What, what does the future uh, look like? A lot of the things you heard today during the presentations kind of kicked off in the direction of, I hate to say this, it sounds trite to say it, but it's getting more and it's getting faster and it's getting more dense. So more displays are going into vehicles and in applications, whatever those are. Even autonomous vehicles. There's somebody who sits in that thing right. at the front end yeah. who needs to know what that's doing and what it sees and what the edge detections are and whether it's seeing a pedestrian or somebody on a bicycle, whether the GPU characterized that guy as the bicycle as a road sign and therefore, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know. Uh-oh. Yeah. So all of these areas of classification is required. There's a lot of feedback. I mean, you, the World War II Museum, I don't know if you went to it yesterday. Sonar. You look at sonar during World War II. What was the sonar process? It was the guy's brains between his ears. Right. He would get the information and have to interpret it as to what it is, where it is, where it's located. Now, today, it's, it's fully automated. You now have complete automatic tracking and automatic detection of potential threats. Right. And therefore, the human is there just to check it, to make sure that he needs some sort of operator interface to do that. So graphics are there. But the GPGPU is not just for graphics. And that was the point I was trying to make during the presentation is it's a DSP engine. You can sure. do anything in that. You, yeah. you can do a 1K FFT in a tenth of the time it takes for a general purpose processor like an Intel or a PowerPC mm -hmm. processor because you've got all of those parallel cores all working on the data set in parallel. So the applications for this kind of technology is just is unlimited. So, Doug, here on Fish Fry, we love talking about autonomous vehicles. So you guys just released with AD Link a VPX system, two-slot featherweight 
for UAVs and other applications that need a lot of processing in a small package. Right. So tell me more about this featherweight system and what kind of benefits it has for me as an engineer. Okay, some of the applications for autonomous vehicles, one purpose or one possible application is automated tugs for jet aircraft. Oh. Because jet fuel rises and lowers. Right now it's low, right, but it's going to go up. Yeah. So it gets very expensive to taxi off a gate a jet airplane, whether it's on one engine or whatever, in order to get it out to the runway, get it staged and ready to go. Sure. So there are now, we, we've worked with a company to create an automated tug called Taxi Boat. It tugs up and ties up to the jet, and you tell it which runway to take it to, and it watches the entire environment. It has LIDAR sensors that looks at the environment around the plane to make sure it's not hitting anything, and it pushes the plane back and takes it out to the runway. Totally automated, and the plane is just still running on its APU. That is so cool. So it's a good way to save money, and it's a good, good way for technology to, I won't say replace the man, because that's a misnomer. Yeah. You know, this automation stuff is going to replace people, bull, and absolutely untrue, because there's a whole host of new people now that have to keep and maintain and sure. understand and get those systems and keep them running. So it's, it's a different type of person, but that's what technology is all about. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Doug. Thank you. My pleasure. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, come on, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, well, sure, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, keyword EE Journal. Folks, this thing is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, which also includes our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series. I'm just saying. <laughs> Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can grab our Fish Frying RSS feed or subscribe to Fish Fry via the iTunes store. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up that I should attend, or even the best geeky hotspot in your city, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 17th, 2017, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>